everybody, Mike Spector Comics, and I'm back. This time, I want to talk to you about my experience today at Rhode Island Comic Con. If you're interested in seeing what I picked up and what the con looked like, stay tuned for that intro. All right, so welcome back. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification so when I do put out some content, you get in a timely fashion. Like I said, I ended up going to Rhode Island Comic Con. It's um, a three-day show. I typically only go to the Friday shows. And I want to say it's been about a couple of years since I've last gone. I, I want to say it was either 2018 or 2019 was the last time I went there. Um, they typically always host it on the first weekend of November. So just if you're ever in the um, New England area and wanted to go pay the uh, show a visit, it, there you go. Um, it was kind of a last minute thing for me. Uh, I didn't plan on going to it because I looked at the guest list for creators and there weren't many, you know, at least not many well known. And the vendors, the comic vendors weren't many as well. So a lot of the um, big critiques going into Rhode Island Comic Con, it's not really uh considered like a comic con like more tailored toward the comic books uh of the convention than anything else and that's one of the the bigger complaints about the show it's becoming more of a pop culture event and i've seen it definitely go in that way the last probably four or five years and um this year was special for rhode island comic con because they were celebrating their 10-year anniversary so uh, while we were walking around you know we were hearing some of the people talking about that. So that was pretty cool. Um, ended up meeting up with a friend in from the, the local area, uh, Boston Chris. Ended up um, seeing him in front of one of the creator booths. Uh, he, he likes going to the creators and uh, talking to them, getting some signatures. And I uh, looked to see what they have. So that was pretty cool. I ended up seeing him in front of um, uh, the first creator that I'm going to talk about. His name was uh, Bart Sears. So... Um, I was walking around with my son and uh, met up with Chris. And like I said, this was kind of a last second thing for me. And, you know, he's going there for the whole weekend. So I'm sure he'll have some cool pickups as well. So check that out. But I um, was walking around and uh, got into the uh, creator booth area, which is typically in the middle uh, aisles of the show. And um, saw some of his work. I didn't have any books from um, Bart Sears to get signed. But um, he came up to us and it was like, oh, you know, towards my son. Oh, here you go. You know, here's, uh, have this. And uh, I believe it was his wife. It was like, oh, these, these prints didn't really sell too well. So uh, I wanted this to give it to you. So uh, he ended up giving me this. This is um, Batman Legends of the Dark Knight. It's a really cool print. Um, you see... Uh, Batman snapping uh, Joker's back, <laughs> and uh, you see there he signed it for for uh, for my son. So that was really cool. Um, I, I like that. So I want to say uh, thank you to Bart Sears for uh, for giving that. And uh, so I'll put that aside. Um, talking more about the show, they uh, going back to it's a, it's a rather large um, convention. It's definitely the largest in the area outside of uh, New York Comic Con. New York Comic Con is definitely the largest comic show on uh, the entirety of the Eastern Seaboard. Um, I'd say Rhode Island Comic Con is by far the largest comic show in New England, um, just by the sheer size, because they use they utilize the uh, Dunkin' Donuts Center, which is the uh, sports arena. Uh, sorry, they, they've changed the name now. I forget what it's called now. It's like the, uh, I think the Amica Pavilion. And they also utilize the uh, convention center right next door. So they actually connect. So you have vendors all along the, um, the arena and uh, also connecting on the two floors for the convention center. So it is very large. Um, on the main floor of the convention is where you have the vast majority of the vendors and the comic book creators. And then on the second, uh, I think it's the second or third floor of the convention, you have the um, celebrities where you can meet the 
celebrity guests that they have there. And, and this year they had a, quite the uh, selection of um, celebrity guests. And, um, you know, from wrestling entertainers all the way to, like, you know, movie stars and singers and so forth. So um, they had quite the panel. Um, but one thing I'd have to be critical on is that they didn't have a lot of comic book creators. So um, the one creator that I did bring books to get signed that I was most excited for was Jay Lee. And when I talked to my buddy Chris, he had already gotten a book signed by him. And actually, I have the same book, um, funny enough, signed by him. So I'm going to show you that first book. And um, this book was, you know, one of the books I wanted to get sent off for uh, grading. But uh, funny enough, CGC was not there, which I was kind of surprised. And they didn't have any uh, comic book, um, like, facilitators. Uh, CBCS was there as well, which I was, I think that was, um, I was, I was surprised to see them there and, uh, not CGC. So, um, but I'm gonna, I'm probably just gonna send this over to CBCS anyways, cause I didn't want to send any, any books off to CBCS. I had like maybe seven or eight books I had with me and in hopes of sending it to um, a facilitator, but no one was there when I ended up finding out. Um, so. Nonetheless, I ended up getting Sentry, number one. Love this cover. Uh, I just think the gold on here pops. He signed it in the gold as well, which I thought was really cool. Um, spoke to uh, Jay Lee for a few minutes. Really nice guy. Uh, he was doing a really cool like Batman um, commission when I was talking to him. And uh, also got this really cool indie book. You know, I like pre... Uh, Pre-code horror and modern horror as well. Uh, modern horror stories are fantastic. So uh, I, I showed him this book. And I know he probably doesn't get this book. He doesn't sign this book too often. He definitely uh, signs this book quite a bit. Because uh, me and, and Chris <laughs> had the same book signed at the show. So which was pretty funny. But um, I ended up getting this book signed. This is uh, Infidel. Infidel issue number one. Really great uh horror story if you haven't had a chance to read this really cool i think the um uh that bronze ish gold color looks really cool on the black cover you know i figured i had to get you know two all black covers signed by one of my uh, uh favorite artists right now in the game um like i said really nice guy and he was telling me that he finds it a lot more difficult to um to do covers on these darker covers because of the way he does the lining and the, the drawing. Uh, I'm not an artist, you know, uh, drawer by any means, but um, he was telling me it's much more difficult to do these darker looking covers than it is for uh, the, his regular covers. So uh, I had a blast uh, meeting uh, Jay Lee. He was the only uh, creator that I was looking uh, to get books signed from. Uh, they had some other really nice... Um, uh, creators that they had Pat Broderick, I had um, Silvestri, not, Sil not Silvestri, um, uh, Rick Leonardi was actually right next door to uh, both Jay Lee and um, Bart Sears, um, Ian Nichols, Chris Campania, and uh, Joe Rubenstein was also there. I've met Joe Rubenstein several times. I think he's there every year. So really nice guy as well. So there was, there was definitely some... Um, good creators there just you know not many so that was one of my big critiques there um and now for the comics that i actually picked up and um before i show the comics i'm just going to show you guys a quick um like minute video of what i got from the con you know like to show you guys like the layout of the con so uh stay tuned for that So uh, hopefully you guys got a little bit of an idea what the show looks like. I just took it from the main floor on the convention. I didn't show you any of the other uh, 
I didn't show you the arena. I didn't show you upstairs. It was just something quick because I was only there for about three hours. So I was kind of like, when I go to shows personally, I'm not there for the whole time. I'm in there in and out, you know, two, three, four hours at most. And uh, I try to get as much done as possible. And, and not having the um, comic creators there was kind of beneficial. Not Sorry, not the comic creators, the um, comic rating company. Uh, because you do end up spending a lot of time at the uh, the booths there when you're when you're dropping off or, or submitting books for grading, um, so that takes up a lot of your time. Not having them there probably saved me about thirty to forty five minutes. Um, so that was, I guess, one of the benefits. Because um, I, like I said, I had seven, eight, seven to nine books I was going to submit that I've already had pressed. They were ready to go. So I'm going to have to just mail them down there and get them great anyway. So that's one of the drawbacks. But um, ended up um, going to one of the booths, one of the vendors, and um, ended up picking up four books. All the books I picked up were Golden Age. Um, out of the, I don't know, probably five, six vendors I spent the most time with, um, I ended up getting the vast majority from one from one vendor. This vendor was called Fantasy Unlimited Comics. Um, I'll show you a little info. He's based out of uh, Albany, New York. So if you're ever in the uh, upstate New York area, um, check him out. He doesn't have like an official store or anything like that. He sells books out of his garage. He has like, from what he said, over 20,000 uh, comics. So if you're in the uh, Albany area, check that out. Um, tons of graded comics. Quite a bit of silver, bronze age, and uh, golden age, and um, and some raws too. Quite a bit of raw. So I've been, you know, trying to pick up some of the EC comics for quite some time, uh, looking around, shopping around, so forth. Um, specifically for the weird science and weird fantasy, also weird science fantasy. So it's <laughs> three different, uh, three different titles. Um, just loving the really cool space covers, uh, rocket covers, just anything to do with space. I've been really fascinated with those sci-fi covers. So, ended up picking three sci-fi covers, uh, three sci-fi books, sorry, uh, one pre-code horror book, and then a superhero book. I'll talk about them all. All right. So, first book, I'll show you. It is Weird Fantasy, issue number 12. Um, so I've been looking out for this book for quite a while. Um, I love this cover. This is an Al Feldstein cover. So you can see here at the bottom. You can see Al Feldstein. Um, just love the rocket cover there. It is a winter cover. You know me. I like collecting seasonal covers as well. I like the snow. I like the trees. Um, I like seeing this, uh, what looks like a nice little fireball. It looks like either a meat... Uh, meteor or whatever it may be just going through the skylight and then on the side there on the top you see the either the you know either two moons two planets whatever it is and these people here on the corner just overlooking the whole scene it looks fantastic i i love this cover you know al Feldstein just knocked it out of the park with this cover um these four books I believe he was asking six hundred dollars for the lot, and uh, and uh, I ended up getting a good deal. I'll tell you after. Um, next book, another great cover um, by Al Feldstein, and uh, this one's lower grade, but these books are all complete. This is Weird Fantasy issue number four, uh, thirteen. I think I said thirteen for the first one. That was twelve. This one's thirteen. Um, another cover I just absolutely love, another space cover. You see the, um, the rocket there, you see the mountains in the backdrop, and then you see this really bright orange planet in the backdrop. It looks incredible. Uh, <laughs> it says, funny enough in the bottom, incredible science fiction stories. Um, I just love this cover. This cover pops. This is um, a lower grade, which I'm happy to have, you know, an entry level. But if you get a really nice copy, this orange planet there really is bright. Um, so 
like I said, love this cover. I'm finally, you know, I'm happy to finally have this book in the collection. And uh, this book was, um, he was asking a hundred bucks for it. So I was like, that's, that's a no brainer um, to get that. And these books, I believe they're from the, I want to say from the early, early to mid fifties, if I'm not mistaken, I can, you know, quickly um, look these up, but, um, but I'm pretty sure they were from the mid, the mid a lot of these sci-fi covers were from the, uh, the mid fifties, the early fifties. So just quickly making sure. Uh, bear with me. Yep. So yeah, weird fantasy, uh, 15 came out in September of 50. So yeah, early fifties. And uh, there's a really nice cover for uh, 17. I was hoping that they had one there too. It looks like um, it looks like Jupiter with another rocket on the side. I, I thought that cover is really fantastic done by uh, Feldstein. They didn't have that there though. But uh, I did pick up Weird Fantasy 22, which as you can see here, another rocket cover. This one's pretty neat because uh, you see you got dinosaur bones there. And <laughs> That's covering the vast majority of the cover. And then um, you see some uh, workers there in space looking like they're trying to bolt on the uh, the bones there to the uh, dinosaur. This one was uh, listed at 200 bucks, um, And it's in pretty nice condition as well. So this is Weird Fantasy uh, 22. And then the last book, the pre-code horror book I was talking about, uh, I was looking for some just cheap, cheap pre-code horror books. And uh, with, with the cover that had a nice eye appeal. So this is from Ace Publishings. And uh, I want to say, what year is this? Probably, I want to say probably mid, uh, mid 50s. I want to take a look. Uh, but I guess it's depending on the issue. This is issue number uh don't even tell you the issue number okay but um this is for this is the beyond i'll show you the cover really cool this is like a graveyard cover um it says i'll have to keep right on so the grave will be ready tomorrow morning what what are these living hands coming out of the earth so <laughs> a really cool cover you see this uh this guy in here uh either trying to bury her or uh excavate her i don't <laughs> i don't really know what's going on but this is a really uh interesting cover uh he had this one listed for 100 bucks and i was like all right this is a no-brainer so this is oh okay so they don't put the issue number on the cover but when you open it up on the uh, splash page this is issue number 12 and this came out in uh, june of 1952 so real early 50s um there's a classic issue, issue number 27, which is definitely the big pricey issue of the uh, series. Has that really cool water skull scuba, uh, scuba cover. And uh, this was like an early one. I was really happy to pick that up. He had that for a hundred bucks. So um, all in all, those, he was asking 600 bucks for the four. I ended up, um, uh, knocking them down to 500 bucks. So I thought that was a really good price to get that down. And, uh, you know, some of these books are just getting harder and harder to find, you know? So I was really, really happy to pick that up. And then I ended up going, I had a little bit of time at the end and I went into the arena. And like I said, the arena, you know, full on arena, full of vendors all around the arena. And uh, the first couple of vendors, I was looking for some books for the little guy. He was looking for some Sonic books. And I'll tell you, for finding a kid's cartoon comic like Sonic the Hedgehog, it was absolutely impossible to find any Sonic the Hedgehog books. Um, one vendor had a Sonic the Hedgehog number one, and he was asking $175. And I was like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to pay $175 just because it's an issue one and you know, my son's just going to read it and just rip it up. I just, just looking for like, you know, any random issue just so we can, we can read it. Um, they didn't, nobody had a single Sonic the Hedgehog book. Uh, 
that was just like a random back issue, you know, and they were saying that a lot of kids just read the books and they ripped them and threw them out. So they're super hard to find. Um, so I ended up just getting him like, um, he, he found a cool Sonic the Hedgehog backpack. So I ended up <laughs> getting him that instead. And he was pretty happy. Um, so I went to two vendors right in the beginning of the arena and they had some comic books there. So I was looking around and one vendor had, uh, a couple of golden age books and, um, you know, and uh, one that caught my eye, this is the only book I bought there. And. It was dirt cheap. He was asking a hundred bucks for it, and I'll show you why. And uh, this is Marvel Family issue number twenty-two. So uh, really cool cover. Obviously, you got Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, and Captain Marvel Junior right there in the background. Um, nice. Uh, What's a Pete Costanza artwork. And um, I don't know who did the cover, though, because it just says Jack Bind, Kurt Schaffenberger, and Pete Costanza artwork. It doesn't say who did the cover and Otto Binder's story. But um, this is pretty early, November, um, April of 1948. And uh, as you can see, the book presents really well. You know, there's the back cover. As you can see, it is a really nice looking book and you're kind of wondering is like why did it get a 0.5 you know and um, well the book is incomplete um, so it says half of the page of half of page 24 missing you know which I guess affects story it was like a coupon cutout um, and because of that it got a 0.5 which <laughs> which I'm really surprised that I just cutting out a, like um, half of the page with you know which is like a coupon cutout with you know what has some of the story in there that uh, affects the, affects the story of the uh, comic book would get a 0.5 considering how nice this presents so I was like hey I'll I'll buy it you know he was asking a hundred bucks I paid um, I, I got him down a little bit to 80 bucks so I bought it for 80 bucks and uh if you know golden age it typically cost you uh, depending on the tier that you have for a membership it's at least 45 dollars to uh to grade the book so um for 80 bucks i was more than happy to pick this up and uh it'll stay in the pc this is a cool i, I just love the cover really cool action scene you see the all three running so uh, uh that's it you know, that was my experience at uh, Rhode Island Comic Con. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, enjoyed the comic books. Um, if you did, please feel free to hit the thumbs up. Um, if you haven't subscribed already, feel free to subscribe. You know, it helps out my channel. And, um, you know, I'm doing more and more giveaways. So uh, if, if you want to be entered into a giveaway, you got to be subscribed to the channel. Um, and uh, like I said, comment down below. Uh, if you went to Rhode Island Comic Con this weekend, you know, let me know what you thought of it. Or, if, you know, just a random comment in general. I'll just, I always respond back. So, uh, until next time, Mark Spectre Comics.